these people are walking around in Nikes and, and track suits and you're in a karate uniform doing kiosk speaking in Japanese in the middle of the hood. Like you're gonna, <laughs> yeah. you're gonna stand out like a sore thumb. <laughs> but can you get past that? If you can get past that, oh my God, right? All of your limitations, all of your social uh, inefficiencies, all of your insecurities, all that shit goes away just by putting on that gi, right? And stepping out into the world that doesn't wear a gi. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Budo Brothers podcast. We have a special guest today. Grammy award winning, dropping dope music like Food and Liquor and some of my favorites like Superstar, The Show Goes On, I know Eric's favorite, Kick Push, GQ, Man of the Year, also community activists with things like Mural, Society of Spoken Art, lifelong martial artist, rapper, producer, entrepreneur, and community advocate, Lupe Fiasco. Welcome to the show. Thank y'all for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, first, first and foremost, want to say that um, my bio is way too long. <laughs> <laughs> we should have just went with dope dude. Just like uh, it's, it, it feels like, oh man, that's that's a lot. <laughs> you do a lot. Yeah, I do. That's that's not a good thing, man. I need to downsize. No way, no way. You have such a body of work that it's it's amazing. Like you've been doing it for a long time, and. Uh, for people who maybe don't follow hip hop, this, this we're talking to an icon in the hip hop industry. So, it's it's such a pleasure to uh, to sit here and chat with you. But we love reaching out to you because we see you in your feed all the time training martial arts. So we'd love to get a little bit of a background about uh, your martial arts. I know it's deeply rooted in your family, and uh, if we could just give us a little bit of insight of uh, of your your training. Well, I want to reciprocate the uh, the voyeurism. I, I stay in tune with you all too, and the uh, the Budo Brothers channel and and some of the uh, the uh, the the training kind of montages and stuff that you have um, to get even more dangerous. So I really appreciate what you all are doing in the martial arts space. And I actually learned and I learned like I won't say a lot because when we yeah. get into the story, you'll see I actually my, my martial arts is is ridiculous. <laughs> the experience, not my not my skills, but the my experience in the martial arts. But I did learn. Um, and actually reinforced some things that we were taught kind of younger or, or were interfaced with younger um, that I've seen kind of being re reciprocated in you all's channel. So it was like, oh yeah, they're legit. They're legit. Amazing. <laughs> but then also for the fashion, for y'all for that, that don't know about fashion, I am currently decked out. Oh, kid it. <laughs> Looking out. good. Look. From, from waist, waist to head. Got the hood gi, gi hat, yeah, all man. that. Oh yeah! Oh, flexing out. <laughs> thank, thank you guys for uh for blessing me with uh the material um over the past like few months. I really appreciate it. It's an honor. It's Man, an it honor. suits your style so bad. So we're grateful. I, I can't wait to beat up somebody in my you know, <laughs> gear. Front, yeah, front kick down the stairs. Pow! Love it. <laughs> so what? Yeah, what got you started? How did your journey start in martial arts? Um, man, like my. So the story goes, my dad, it all stems from my father. Um, so we're my, my, I'm second generation um, martial artist. Um, like my dad would, you can, you could consider my dad, like the, the headmaster originator um, of the particular martial arts experience. I hesitate to call it like a, a, a rue um, or like a style um because it encompassed so many different things and i'll kind of i'll kind of add into that but it started with my dad um he was like i think he said he was like his myth is he was like 14 or something like that and uh was going around the projects in chicago so he was he was he was from born in chicago um grew up in the projects the robert taylor homes um and it was kind of at a time where he was like one of the first people in the projects you know when it was nice okay you know? and then like I guess over time, the projects became the projects, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, you had the influx of all these kind of different, you know, gang things and stuff like that. So my dad was kind of like, almost like a vigilante, you know, where he would, he would be one of the guys, you know, fighting back against the gangs, protecting the neighborhood and stuff like that. Um, and at the time there was, a, there was a, a theater in Chicago called Mac Victor's and they used to show Kung Fu films. You know, so they would import the Kung Fu films. So my dad would always say like, 
you know, his, I would say his starting point was Five Fingers of Death, the movie. Okay, the movie. yeah. Um, and he said they would just go see it at Mac Victor's all the time. Five Fingers of Death, Five Fingers. Of Death. For y'all don't know, Five Fingers of Death is one of the classic old classic, kung classic, fu films. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember he was saying like they would be in the projects because everybody would go see it. He they would be in the projects, and there's a there's a scene in uh, Five Fingers of Death where they're like Yin Yin, and it's like Lee Ao Yin Yin, and you would hear one <laughs> you hear one person on this side of the project say Yin Yin, and then another person <laughs> on this side of the project responds. <laughs> But anyway, that was kind of like his interface with the martial arts. And from that point on, he started to train, you know, um, he sought out instructors from all these different styles. So now I'm compressing. So he would, you know, he, his judo instructor was a, a, a instructor who's still alive today named Master, Master, Master Shin, who's based in Chicago, um, who's actually one of the early um, folks in, in Kyukushin Kai um, and a, a judo expert and, and taught all these different things and has a school now called Military Arts Institute. Um, so my dad trained judo with him, uh, went to the Japanese Cultural Center in Chicago and trained Aikido with, with Master Toyota, um, you know, and then just started to pick up all these different things, you know. So I have his original copy of This Is Karate from, Mas from Masoyama, right? Wow. Um, and when I don't, I didn't recognize it at the time when we were kids, but our, our karate program was basically This Is Karate. It was basically Kyukushin Kai's Masoyama's This Is Karate book, right? From every from the stances, from the the techniques to the training to the exercise, the whole thing. So my dad basically just took this book and turned it into our karate school, so to speak. Cool. But in that, you have Aikido, you have Judo, uh, you have Iaido, um, we had uh, Wushu, we had various styles of Kung Fu, we had Gojuru, we had Shotokan. So we had all these different pieces and parts from the martial arts world. Um, in addition to a lot of the, the cultural stuff that was in there as well. So, you know, we would, you know, like we had, you know, dojos that were like, this looks like a dojo fresh out of Japan, you know? Sick. And then another dojo, which looks like a obstacle course from like American gladiators that, was trying to, <laughs> that would try and kill you. Right. Um, and, you know, I learned how to count in Japanese before I could count English, you know, because we were doing karate that young and oh, so wow. everything was in Japanese, you know? Wow. Um, so I was born into it. So my dad had his first school, uh, actually a few blocks away from the projects. Um, it was called the Black Dragon Slayers. Um, and you know, that, that the, the story goes that, you know, he had the school with a few other instructors and then they all went to the dark side. So he had to start a new school called Tornado. And that's what we come into the picture. That's when we were born in the eighties. That sounds like a Kung Fu movie itself right there. <laughs> yeah, like one of the, the original school turns bad and then he has to start like this new school so he started tornado um and tornado school is where i started so i was born in 82 and i've been doing martial arts since 1982 you know like since i was a baby so there, yeah. there's you know there's photos of me when i'm like a, a young i don't even know how, how old i am in the photos just sitting there in a the gi you know just rocking out doing whatever um competing since very young um winning tournaments from kata to to kumite to whatever um and because it was the family business, so we had schools, you know, we would have one school on South Side of Chicago, one school on West Side of Chicago. Um, and, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you know, we're at the, we're at the school, right. you know, training, working out. And then when we come home, because my dad was very much so um, a, real, a real martial arts guy, you know, our, the dojo was at home. So you go home and there's a wall of weapons you know, there's training dummies and stuff like well, I won't say training dummies, but there's like training apparatuses outside, you know, there he's doing like weekend retreats where his, his, uh, his top students would come to the house and train and he would show them like Okuden and secret technique and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, man, my life was, um, it was completely immersed in the martial arts since I was born. Um, and I actually trained and instructed and taught all the way up until I was about like maybe 16 i think i got my black belt when i was like 10 um and i would you know junior instructor up until i was about like maybe maybe 15 16 and then i stopped to start rapping <laughs> nice so you took a little a little hiatus from it like how how long because you came back obviously so oh, a very a very long hiatus oh really yeah so i didn't get back into consistently training until like maybe a few years ago um, 
And like, it was crazy because I would go to, like when I, when I was, had the opportunity. So I wanted to go to Japan since I was a kid. I was like, I want to live in Japan because they walk around in Hakaman, they work in dogies all day and I want to work all those, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Knowing that they had like video games and cars and all, I thought it was like samurai times in Japan. <laughs> okay. So when I was going to Japan, when I first started to go to Japan, I was going for music. I wasn't even thinking about martial arts. I wasn't even thinking like, oh, let me go get a gi. Oh, yo, let me go to this martial arts store and get a sword. Or let me go here and get some size. Or let me go to Okinawa and do so. I was like, where the Nikes at? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was strange in that, that you know, I had that pivot kind of in my in my midlife now. I was in my, in my late teens where I just wanted to do rap. I just wanted to do music, you know. And I, I still kept up with the martial arts. But at that point, I've been doing it, you know, let's call it since three years old, like legit. Yeah. I've been doing it for, you know, 10, 12 years, you know, so it was already in me and, and like teaching, you know, like teaching Tai Chi classes as much as Tai Chi as I knew, right. And teaching full on karate classes and doing, ex, ex, doing examinations for, for my EI doll and, and doing all that stuff. So, you know, I got to that point. I was like, I already know how to do all that. I want to do something else. And then a few years, a few years ago, I was like, you know what? I want to go back to my martial arts. So for the past few years, I've been back training heavy. Nice, nice. And what did, what does your current training look like? Are you training privately, solo, group classes? I'm sure if there was group classes, there'd be, yo, can I get a signature? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the same mix that my dad, pro. You know, I'm I'm just a, a a replication of my dad. You know, so every facet that he trained in and introduced us to the martial arts through, I still do that today. So I train privately because I know a lot of the stuff. Um, so I don't really need, you know, like a class and I probably wouldn't fit in a class. That's kind of one of the, that's, that's kind of one of the, let's call it a downside of being in a school like that, a program like that is that you learn so much stuff that you're, you're, and it's not like, it's not like you're paying tuition to go. And there's pressure on the sensei to teach you from a certain set of examinations and stuff like that. It's like you're 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 tr you're like karate kid. Like your training is constant. You're if you're not training physically, you're training mentally. If you're not training mentally, you're doing something academic in the martial arts. You're reading books and stuff like that. So I was reading Budo Shoshinso and all these these manuals when I was like nine years old, ten years old, right? Um, and all these wushu manuals and this was bananas. But when you're doing it that in that deep. Like, and you go to just like a regular karate school, like you don't fit, you know, right. because you're incorporating, you know, drunken boxing into this Taekwondo, you know, skill set. And there's a little mix of judo. And then as soon as dude grabs you, you're like poking him in the eyes. And you're like, <laughs> you can't do that. Like, you just have to focus on doing this kata. And you're like, but katas are boring. Right. You know, like we, we did, we, 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 we broke through that kind of barrier of like, Let's just do a bunch of katas all day. It's like, yo, katas are boring as hell. Let's jump off the roof of the house. Won't we do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I can't really fit in a, in a traditional school program unless I start from scratch, you know? So so I wanted to do, you know, my friend uh, Bear, who who's at Show Your Role, um, I was like, you know, I want to get into BJJ, right? And I already did some BJJ nogi right with an instructor from brazil which was like a private lesson and this was like some years ago um but then i was like you know what let me get into just this bjj like this this bjj that exists modern wise right um and start, started to kind of look for a school um but when you're a rapper you know it's like yeah i'll be there when's the class saturday okay i have a concert on saturday when's the next <laughs> one? it's tuesday yeah. oh, i got a concert on tuesday right. when's the next one Oh, Wednesday, I got a concert on Wednesday. So it's, it, it kind of <laughs> limits my schedule being a rapper. And then also the way we were trained kind of eliminates a traditional school program unless I start from scratch. So okay. right now, to answer the question, I train privately, um, you know, and the techniques and stuff that I, that I already know. Um, if I need reinforcement in a certain thing, I'll, I'll do what everybody else does and watch YouTube. You know, nice. so I'll jump on YouTube, like what's Anandai? I need to, what's that move for this kata? Okay, let me see. Um, but I'm also training a uh, 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 Jodo from scratch. So shout to Sensei Mike Belzer, um, who, um, who's, who's an aficionado in Shindo Muso Ryu uh, Jodo. So I'm doing Jodo from scratch. Cool. Okay. Nice. I've, been I've been training that the past like few months from scratch. Um, I, tra I try to train every day, Wushu one day, Karate the next day, 
yeah, today's Eido day. Nice. Okay. So I just just finished training when I got with you guys. I'm gonna go back out and, and do some more. Um, and I just, yeah, that's my mix, man. That's so, beautiful. So yeah, I wanted to I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, passion and purpose. So we believe that when passion and purpose collide, you get service. And we see that you are ultra passionate about the rap game and hip hop, and you constantly are in this like creative cycle in fact it's it's just amazing the amount of volume you've outputted and also not losing your essence of who you truly are especially in a commercialized industry like hip-hop could you talk to us a little bit about the journey of hip-hop what 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 drew you to it and like how you serve people through it Mm. um so you know again going back to my dad you know, my dad did all this martial arts stuff, right? But he was also a musician, you mm-hmm. know? And he was also an engineer, you know? And he was also, you know, like he collected Star Wars figurines and all this other crazy stuff. So so there's pieces of me and everything I do with my dad and, and my mom. Um, my mom was a seamstress, so I'm around here like sewing patches on uniforms and stuff like that, but anyway. Um, so my dad, he was a musician. And so the house was not only filled with all these dangerous weapons, um, and martial arts memorabilia and, and library, but it was also, you know, full of instruments, you know, so there would be Indian tablas, you know, and there would be sitars, you know, three sitars, you know, just in the living room. Like, why are there three sitars, let alone <laughs> sitar? <laughs> I don't even know what a sitar is. Uh, so like Ravi Shankar, kind of like Indian guitar. Okay, okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Should train to it sometimes. Like my actually, that's hey. how my my dad actually used to, music was a big part of our um, martial arts experience. Um, we had a drum a drum core that would do like taiko and kodo and African drums kind of mixed together. So whenever we did demonstrations, you hear like this crazy drumming, and it would be like our drum orchestra. You know, we had a school drum, a big taiko in, in in the school. So anyways, all these instruments and all this stuff was there. My dad used to make these drums like in the in the bathtub um, to soak the skins and then put them on the drums and take them to the school and the kids would learn how to play drums and my dad was an African drummer and all that so he was a full-on kind of like musician type music was always around us um and you know he had a myriad of instruments so he had like a clarinet just sitting I wanted to play the clarinet I wanted to be like Benny Goodman um so I wanted to play jazz that was like my thing like I want to be jazz musician I want to play jazz I want to play jazz and uh you know I, I got around like maybe f- maybe high school so like freshman year and I, I I watched the Benny Goodman story somewhere in there, and I was like, yes, I'm I'm doing it. And I went to high school, and I was like, hey, went to the band department, I was like, hey, can y'all teach me how to play the clarinet? And it was like, nope, um, you were supposed to learn that back in your music program in in junior high or grade school. And I was like, but no, I told me. And then it was like, oh well, you have to go to music school and blah blah blah. And I was like, I don't have the patience for that. So I started to rap. So rap seemed like the next best thing because it was easy, huh. right? And all my homies were doing it. So my whole crew in high school, like we started, all started to rap together. And so it became like, yeah, I'm gonna be a rapper, you know? And so rap filled the jazz void, the clarinet void. And initially it was just, you know, these words, you know, there's something about these words and telling these stories and vibing with my homies. And I would come home from school and write a bunch of raps um, until it was, and realized that it was, you know, six o'clock and I had to go back to school, you know, so I would come home from school and write all through the night, all through the morning until it was time to go back just to go to write one verse to go back to school to spit to my homies. Amazing. Um, and so I just fell in love with it. It became my cycle. It became my, my life. And then I got a record deal when I was still in high school, you know, wow. so it's like when I started, started at the beginning of high school, maybe junior high, high school. And then by the time I'm leaving high school, I'm looking at record deals and yeah. I went straight into the industry. And it was like, that's my journey, basically. But it was like, what was I don't the, know if it, I don't ahead, know sorry. if it had a purpose. Mm. You know, I don't know if it had a wider purpose beyond just, you know, checking off a, a, a music thing. You know, here's my version of my dad doing music. You know, he did his his music, his African music, and and his his ethnic kind of music. And I'm gonna do the music of my times, which is hip hop. You know. And he introduced me to hip hop. So he introduced me to NWA and, and Public Enemy and, and De La Soul. And like, that's what he was playing 
um, in addition to all this other stuff. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna do that. You know, and then it gained a purpose as I started to go through life, you know, cause I'm, I'm, I'm still a teenager in the music business. So it's like, what is purpose? What are you talking about? Like, let's, right. get, let's get this money and bust these raps. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Right. So it turns into, turns into purpose as I go through my career. So do you think being exposed to martial arts at a very young age had an influence on your music? Um, or your journey at all? I'm not exposed to martial arts. You know, this gonna this sound this gonna found this gonna sound very Steven Seagal uh esque people like you know McDojo type shit. But <laughs> the difference between uh, it, it may you know with me, I wasn't exposed to martial arts. We were martial arts, you know. So it's a, it's a different kind of purview, and I, and I stand on that because you meet guys. It's like, so when did you start training? And I'll say, oh, man, I started training when I was 20. Hmm. You know, um, even people that came into our school, you know, uh, imagine we had school since the 70s, you know, not since the 90s, you know, not since the 2000s, since the 70s, right? Yeah. Um, and my dad's been training martial arts since the 60s, you know, um, and the entire family's black belts. You know, so my sisters are black belts. My brothers are black belts and they're all in different expertises. You know, my, my brother is a, a judo, does judo and jujitsu and stuff like that. Um, and my dad would have went, been world champion in judo, you know? Um, so it's like, we're not, it wasn't like this was an option. Like you were born into a gi. Right, yeah. Like you were born and this is what you know. Like the 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 first person I ever saw in a, in a karate uniform was my dad. The first time I ever saw a katana was in the hands of my dad. The first place I ever received a katana was from my dad. The first place that I ever heard Japanese was from my dad. The first place that I ever got an arrow shot at me at the end of the dojo was my dad. <laughs> the first place we ever walked across hot coals was with my dad nice. in my yard. The first place that we ever kicked out candles and punched out shit was in my dad, you know? So it's like, that. those are my early experiences. There, it's not like, Oh, you were doing regular stuff and holidays and you know going to school and then it's like okay then you get here's the martial arts and then it, it kind of changes you so i say all that to say i don't know anything else hmm. you know like i don't there is no this influence this because you got introduced to that and you already had this set of programming and then martial arts came in and then it altered that programming or gave you a different perspective it's like no 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 we've always done the martial arts I don't know anything else. So the rest of life, right, just has always been experienced, you know, as a martial arts experience. That's you know, really it's cool. never been kind of anything else. Um, Do you see anywhere where that sets you apart from people or ahead of people um, having that experience being different? Yeah, work ethic, perseverance, coming over adversity. Has any of that spilled over? Um. I mean, there's so many different layers and levels to the martial arts, you know, so which you all know, there's competitive stuff. So there's a whole set of ideologies and philosophies specifically for competitive martial arts, right? Which is legit and genuine, you know, so sport competition, stuff like that. Then there's a whole like esoteric, you know, wellness, health, internal thing to the martial arts, which has its own set of philosophies and history, historiographies and stuff like that. Then you have like just full on combat right, which has its own set of philosophies and blah, 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 right? And then you have spiritual, which has its own set of blah, blah. And then you have uh, uh, play in the martial arts and that has its own set of philosophies and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, it's a, it, it's not like one specific, um, one size fits all kind of thing, right? So it's like, yeah, you could you could look at your business and you can approach it legitimately from a competitive martial arts philosophy standpoint, or you can approach it from a a a more budo, you know, uh, or bujitsu way, right? Really combat, kill something type of view. Or you can approach it from a really spiritual kind of aspect, you know. But all of them are legitimate, you know. All of them are legitimate, regardless of how you, which one you use. It's, I guess it's all just kind of what your intentions are. So for me. What, I, what I've leaned into and kind of set on as like what I choose to guide 
myself through life from the martial arts experience is from EI Do um, and the concept of EI, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that the harmony, right? So it's not about being at peace, right? It's not about being at war. It's not about being brave. It's not about being a coward. It's not about being uh, ethical, right? And it's not about being um, non-ethical. It's about being harmonious to what the situation is, right? So if I have to kill this guy, I gotta kill this guy, right? If I have to let this guy beat me up so I don't go to jail, then I gotta let this guy beat me up. At least think that he beat me up, right? Um, So for me, it's about, recently it's been that. It's been the harmony piece, you know, as opposed to trying to extract peace from a situation that isn't constructed to generate peace, right? Or to insert war into a situation that doesn't require that or sport into a situation that doesn't require that or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think it's that, the, the, the piece about harmony and figuring that out. And then Mugi Mushin, you know, which is kind of prefaces it all. But yeah, the EI piece. I love that. One thing that uh, we really notice about you and, and even when you're speaking on social media is your authenticity and how that leads your creative, creative process. Uh, we try to do the same thing. Like we want to create amazing products that people enjoy and engage with and get a good vibe from, right? Could you talk a little bit about your creative process and, and how you keep putting out um, innovative things? Yeah, I can. It's 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 very much so like uh you know, like cuz and when I was doing music, you know, music is my main product, right? So when I was doing music again, it was like in high school and I was just learning the ropes, you know. And I was doing it without any you know, expectation of commercial this. It was like here's a cultural thing that I do. Um 9 times out of 10, I'm going to go into the theater, I'm going to go into the military. You know, or I'm a, I'm a revert back to my martial arts and then I'll be at an age, you know, in my late teens where I'll really be able to start perfecting and doing the training and have a, a higher level of discipline. And I'll probably pick up where my dad left off. Right. Um, so music, it never had a real intention or a goal. And it was literally just like one of my homies saying one day, like, yo, you know what? You sound like you could be on the radio. You know, it was like, yo, you sound like you can do this for real. It was like, I guess. Right. And then it all comes to fruition, you get a deal. So you get this record deal and I don't know what to do, you know? So it's like, who do I, like, I'm, I'm still learning how to do this. Like, I'm still learning how to be a rapper. Like I'm still learning the history and I'm still learning techniques and blah, 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 blah. Um, but now you have a record deal. So now you have to produce, produce what? Commercial product. You know, you have to put stuff that's going to sell, yeah. you know? Um, so it's like, okay, let me learn how to do that. You know, so you're, you're spending a bunch of time learning like learning that, you know? Um, But then also it's at a time in hip hop where you could still be creative and free and open and there's still ciphers and it's still about lyrics and this, that, and the third. So I'm, I'm, I'm brought up in that, but I'm looking down the barrel of like um, trap music, you know, and Atlanta starting to kind of take over. So you would hear big L on the radio and then turn around and hear like yin yang twins. And you're like, Oh, something's happening, you know? What, what what's going on? And not to say that that wasn't the case. You had no limit on stuff, but it's the difference when you're in the business creating, as opposed to in the '90s, you're looking at it from a distance. So you're and it's like, oh, this is finna change. So now I need to do some of that. I need to at least learn what that looks like and what that feels like, because that's now that's gonna be my competition, right? So it really became like, you know, to make a you know parallel to the martial arts, it really became like an arms race, you know, of like learn these different techniques acquire these different skill sets, acquire these different weapons to be commercially successful, to set yourself apart in this arena. And it's because it became a, it became a, a kumite, right? It became like a a tournament. Um, And it was like, oh shit. So some of my skill sets got steered and my creativity got steered toward creating commercial product, you know? But at the same time, I'm completely a backpack MC, you know, still doing mixtapes, this whole time doing mixtapes, doing like just, 
crazy things that would never get played on the radio like just enter like off can i rap like biggie smalls i'm gonna see if i can rap like do 10 songs like biggie smalls and see what happens you know and mm-hmm. these bars and these lyrics how complicated can i let me do a six layer on tandre let me do this other, like all this other stuff that the industry doesn't give a fuck about right yeah um but i'm doing that in parallel too so it's like i always had these two careers you know i, I was reading like apple music like my their blurb on me one time and it was like uh, something of the effect where like Lupe Fiasco is an underground rapper that found mainstream success, but is also a mainstream rapper who found underground success, right? <laughs> so it's like in these two worlds, completely separate, two completely set for separate sets of goals. And I'm still able to do a show goes on, but then turn around and do a mural, right? right? And it's, it, it, it even, it trips me out, right? Cause sometimes I don't know. You know, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. And then it becomes like, yeah, that feels good though. You know, so it feels good not to have a goal, not to have an intention, just to purely create and free flow and and be Mugi Mushin, right? To have no mind, right? right? And just create from whatever comes out. And so you get albums like that, where it's like, I'll have songs where it's like, ah, oh, whatever comes up, you just land it, it sticks. Then the very next song is like structured format, three verses, you know, half of a third verse with a, a singy bridge to close that off and then double the hook and then ad libs for this and then make sure that, and it's very structured. And then the next song will be this wild ass fucking concept with three beats and, you know, so I, that type of creative process for me, um, it doesn't work all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't transfer easily out into other arenas. I'm learning how to do that now and project that type of, um, approach to business or to you know something outside of the sphere of music um so I'm, i feel somewhat handicapped but also feel somewhat free so it's just kind of like love it it's, it's be- that's beautiful <laughs> it's beautiful it's not i mean you're experimenting and you're trying new things and free flowing and seeing what arrives have you ever had it where one of these experiments you run in your creative process turns out something that you you're not you're like meh it's okay but then it just rips like you i know that's happened to yeah. us a couple times where we're throwaway like, ah, video this is a throwaway video it's probably not gonna do and then it goes viral it's like <laughs> how did that happen i thought it was garbage yeah <laughs> does that ever happen in your process um yeah sure you know it happens in reverse too which hurts. yeah oh yeah. big time For that's sure. happened to us a lot <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's happened a few times. I mean, I, I, I hesitate to, you know, cause you know, part, part of my experience has been to, you know, eliminate the, the mysticism of things, you know? Um, and we were born, we were born into a household that practiced Islam and, you know, but also interfacing with all these different faiths and these different ideas and technologies and, and stuff like that um and so there's a lot of like mysticism attached to the martial arts practice in certain styles and certain schools right um yeah the head instructor he laid out a mat on top of blades of grass and sat on the grass and didn't bend any of the blades like that that didn't happen <laughs> you know but it's part of the programming the hyperbole of of what we do you know, of of the Okuden, the secret techniques and stuff like that. Um, even things like chi and, and, and what that means, you know, and some people get really wild, you know, with it, go way out the box with it. Um, and so for, for me, it's been a process of like, when you get to the like, no, what is it really? You know, like eliminate all of the, you know, like what were we trying to do? It's like, oh, we're just trying to have a better story than the next school, mm-hmm. you know, or we were this, this, this was generated at a time, this style was generated in, in a time where there was a lot of superstition, you know, there was no technology, there was no, you know, scientific method, there was no of this other kind of stuff. Um, so for me, that that's what they, that's how they expressed this particular experience or this particular feeling, right? Because the only, the only things that they had um at their time and this is true even today you know in modern times you know there's people who live in certain cultural silos where they only express the world through the things that they know right um and it may come across as very either either 
overly complicated or very primitive, right? Um, and you have to kind of find, or hopefully you find some type of universal language that everybody can kind of agree with that eliminates a lot of that mysticism. So for me, it's, it's been this thing like eliminate a much, as much of that kind of mysticism from the practice and get down to like, how does this really work? And does this accomplish the goal? And so there is something to say that not knowing what you're doing leads to these very interesting or, you know, you're, you, you're not managing your expectations or you manage your expectations wrongly and then kind of luck took over, right? And it was like, oh, it just happened. We, nobody knew. Um, but then also you might be unconsciously, somebody else might come in and be able to look at what you're doing and see the structure in it and why it works, you know, and express kind of like, yes, it's this, 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 your timing, right? When did you put it out? You know, was there a lot of competition in that space? How, what was your, your, uh, your, your SO, what did they call it? SOE, SEA, whatever. The SEO. Yeah. <laughs> Search engine. Yeah. Un un unconsciously that yeah. that had a place to do with it. Um, the subject matter, you know, sometimes we get, we get too caught up in, um, these highfalutin, high technical things. Um, and we kind of lose people, but then we just do something very basic and very simple, you know, then it becomes like, Oh yeah. 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 yeah that, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's fucking amazing, right? But it's like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I'm the dumbest thing that's ever been born. So it's like, there you go. Um, but no, it's, it's that piece of like, I don't really believe anymore in this kind of concept of, you know, things just happen. You know, I, I feel that there's a, a structure and an explanation for everything. Um, and, and part of that comes from, you know, the, to relate it back to the martial arts, is this martial arts experience of this thing like the Ohuldin and these secret techniques and what is actually happening, you know, and what's the actual goal of this and what is it meant to do? Um, where does the mysticism and kind of the, what was the goal of the secrecy, right? Some of it was like, I'm gonna teach you some bullshit that doesn't work. So you're not able to go and, you know, start your own school. Yeah. Right. So this is the sensei or the instructor trapping his students in his particular program and then telling them you can't ever go compete with another school. You know, right. that happens today. Right. Yeah. Um, and it'll teach you some shit that is like, and then when they're about to die or when they're about to, you know, you reach a certain level, you've been in the school for 50 years, you know, or 15 years or 20 years, then they'll show you the, the bunkai. You know, then they'll show you the application, you know, then they'll eliminate, say, don't, don't worry about this. Right. Um, do this. This is all you ever needed to do. And you're sitting there like sensei, I'm a, you mother, you, know, <laughs> you want old in my sensei, I will beat your ass right now for putting me through 10 years when you could have taught me this shit in two weeks. Right. You know, but then it becomes, well, what's the goal in that? So anyway, you know, I feel that, that, you know, nothing just happens, you know, it's like, if we go back and really analyze the successes of the things that we did, we'll see that there is a structure that's tapping into um, very real and visceral things that people respond to. Love it. Isn't that so true though? It's, it's so true to even entrepreneurship, how you can do all of these different things, but somebody can look at it and just be like, this is, this is the path. This is the Avenue. And it just, it's always about simplifying things that, that that apple quote simplicity is the ultimate sophistication i think that's such a universal thing because even in martial arts you can have all these techniques all of these different applications but at the end of the day it's just distance time and you know a bit of attributes at, at, at some point in time as well too and how you use those things can uh, dictate uh, dictate how you do in a fight um, one thing in martial arts is is adversity um we find that a commonality amongst a lot of our people we talk to and people within our community is how they deal with adversity. How do you deal with adversity and what, what do you do to get through it? Oh man, a, a lot of y'all got it really, really good. A lot of the modern martial arts guys who've been in it for, I'm even say dudes who's been in it for 20 years, right? Like I've been doing it for 25 years. Like, man, you had it good. <laughs> Cause if you were doing this shit in the eighties, my guy, when there was no rules and no insurance and you met up with somebody like my dad or some of some of his instructors. Oh yeah. 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 You're, you're, you're running barefoot in the snow, God. you know, 
Like you're doing that. You're jumping out of the second floor of this building. Like you're doing that. Like why are we doing this? Like you're doing that. <laughs> like we're we're dive rolling over these cars from concrete to concrete. Like we're doing that. Crazy. You know? Like, you know, you're gonna reach into this boiling pot of water and pull out this stone that's at the bottom that's been sitting there for six hours. Like you're gonna do that. In the ghetto on the west side of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> With these, you know, with 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 people driving around in, in cars and banging music, and you're in the hood, you're you're in a gi, right? Getting laughed at, right? Reaching into a gigantic cauldron of fucking boiling water, trying to pull this stone out the bottom. <laughs> um, and so I say that to say, like, again, it was adversity. There was no like, it wasn't like there's martial arts and then let's incorporate some adversity into it. It was like, no, we're gonna start with adversity. Like you're just gonna do that's what you do. Like you're a black belt in adversity. And then there's some there's some martial arts attached to that, right? Um, cause it was rough. Like the training was so hard, man. Like super hard. Like when we the the first dojo I remember, um, when you go in, there was it was dark and it was a gigantic poster of Masoyama, right? So as soon as you walk in, big ball head, man. And it's, a, it's the famous picture where he's punching out the candle, like Seiken Suki, punching out the candle. And, uh, but that's when you see this menacing monster. And if you know anything about Kai karate, it's the roughest karate, period. That's period. There's nothing else that compares, right? Uh, maybe Shirinji Kimpo, maybe. But in terms of just karate, it's... Kyushin Kai is, is fucking for maniacs. Yeah. People who love to get smashed. <laughs> Hit all the time. <laughs> Let's fight full contact right now. Every class, like, why are we doing this? Like, why don't we just do yeah. some kata, right? Everything's hard spar. Yeah. You know? So, but that's your, that's your guy. You know, in your school, it's not like, you know, it's not like Jigoro, Kano. I mean, we had, we had pictures of all the senseis, you know, that, that was there. But it was like the biggest poster was Mass Oyama. And it was like, yeah, you're coming here to get hurt. Like you're coming here to die. Like you're coming here to punch this wall. You're coming in here to, to body train. You're coming in a body harden, right? Pure, pure violent, you know, situation. So for us, the adversity was always there. So that's why I say we don't, when I say we all my, and all my, all my dad's students will attest to this. It's not just me like talking shit, right? Like they'll all attest to this. It's like, oh, that's nothing. Like y'all did what? That was y'all special training day? Like we did that shit every day, right? Like you walked on rocks today? Like yeah, the, we had a rock. You couldn't get to the dojo unless you walked through some rocks, right? Like very sharp stones that, you know, fuck your feet up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that got you. That's why I, that's why I train on concrete. Be like, how the fuck can you do that? I was like, what do you mean? How can you not do that, right? Um, so we had adversity built in from the jump. So now when I look at certain situations and certain things in the world, it's very easy for me to go full cycle very quickly, very calmly. And I say that in that, you know, you generate that discipline because like, oh, I'm finna get hit by this car. Okay, let's go. You know, or I'm gonna have to run through this, this fire, right? And it's like, okay, you know, and you see people who like, if, when people are doing breaking, right? They're like, ah, ah, ah. and we'll get up there and it's like, pop, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, go through. We, we, you're, you're, you're supposed to be, you know, our class model, our school model was always ready. Right. You know, always ready, which is relates to EI. But it was like, you were you were tuned to be at a, at that level all the time, but not to the point where it breaks you, right? Where you just absorb. You got to know how to release, right? You got to know how to heal as much as you know how to destroy. So we would get introduced to all this adversity, physically, spiritually, mentally, just taxing shit. Like my dad was, it was like this dude's a sociopath, right? Um, but then you would hit these plateaus and these limits, or you break through these barriers, and you're like, yo, I could do anything. You know, and then you you put that on business. And it's like I can do anything. Like you're gonna lose a million dollars. Like so, yeah. You know that's adversity, right? Like you're risking losing. Like you, so you mean you're gonna stand on your morals and lose this record deal? It's like yeah. 
there's there's other record deals you know Beautiful. so you're gonna stand on this 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 losing you're gonna fight this losing battle like yeah right yeah i am you know because that's some badass shit to do right it's that's like gangster yeah yeah, yeah that's and, gangster and that's that's that <laughs> authenticity right like that's what makes you an authentic individual i mean you're you you know who you are you've you've gone through you've walked through the coals and i really feel like martial arts does that to to everyone who does choose that path and this is why we're so passionate about sharing and spreading and celebrating all martial arts and encouraging people that who haven't tried training in martial arts to to get involved yeah. you know and the community keeps growing and i think community is such an important part i'd be curious to get your thoughts on how you built your community of followers and fans that have have stood by you've got some of the strongest most dedicated fans in the game how did you build that community well like mass like masoyama built the kyukshinkai community right like you know I think Kyushin Kai is one of the large, if if not, I don't know if it still is, but one of the largest, you know, martial arts associations in the world. You know, right. um, I think millions of members, if I'm not mistaken. I could be, I don't want to jump into it, but it's like that. Like these martial arts associations will have, how many members do you have? Like we have two million members. Wow. You know, things like that. You know, how many people do BJJ, right? Yeah. Or how many people do Gracie style BJJ, right? You're like, oh, probably millions. You know, how many people are part of the the uh, Kendo Federation of Japan, whatever, you know, uh, two million, three million. Right. So it's like, how do you maintain that type of fan base, if you want to call it that? Right. Again, trying to relate everything back to the martial arts. Um, <clears throat> you got to put them through trials and tribulations, man. You know, uh, and me and my fans have been through a lot of shit together, you know, um, and I have fans that are just kind of on the periphery. You know, there are fans of Show Goes On, you know, and that's it. They don't even know the mixtapes exist, you know, type thing. And then I got fans that are with it all. They've listened to every song, every mixtape, every they've done the due diligence to find all the Easter eggs and they sit and they process this fucking wall of lyrics, right? And they come out the other side, black belts. You know what I'm saying? Like they come out, they come out the other and people it 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 it, it kind of it's crazy to people, and my fans will throw around this term goat. So they'll turn the greatest of all time. And people like, and then you'll see like a commercial list. I'm not even on the list of rappers. You know, it'll be every other guy but me. And if I am, I'll be they'll I'll be 40 or 50 or something like that. And my fans were like, no, nah, that dude's the best lyricist of all time. Right? And they're like, how? And then they'll 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 you know write themselves, you know. And then proceed to lay out how over the course of 20 years and hundreds of songs that he, me, has touched on all these different things, all these different layers, connected this song to this, this album was connected to this, this scheme plot was connected to this, this means six things, this means eight, this means 12 things. This is da, 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 And they're like, yo, how can you even compare that to your top five, right? right? Who has, yeah, they did this and they did that, but Lupe did it six times, right? Or Lupe did it this or this, 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 that. But because it's so niche and because it requires so much patience and so much discipline, right? And so much adversity to sit there and read through. I mean, it's, 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 it's songs and me being an asshole don't give you the, the punchline. You know, I just, I'm like, I'm not telling you what that means. Right. So they're like, come on, man, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see people who, who post up on social media and they're like, Lupe, I've been listening to this song for six years. And I was driving in the car and I drove past this gas station and I looked at the name of the gas station and it, it, I, it, I learned that that was the reference for the song and it blew my fucking mind. Nice. You know? So it's that type of like Ooh. dedication and then reward that comes out of, mm -hmm. you know, processing and staying within it. And it's not all my songs, but it is a lot of my songs that are like that. So my fans, they've been through that rough, hardcore training, broken bones, callous the hands, you know, did, did all of that throughout the shoulder, the whole piece. And I think that's why I have that really solid core, you know, of fans. And they come in, they come out, and I keep it very real with them. 
you know i don't i don't sugarcoat shit with them um you know i i understand that it's a 50 50 relationship with my fans um i'm gonna give you 50 you're gonna give me your 50 but i'm gonna give you my 50 yeah. right um i'm not your fucking servant mm-hmm. you know i'm someone who you choose to participate in and in response to that i over indulge you you know so i'm gonna give you an album and 10 songs on the way to giving the album. You're gonna pay for the album, but these 10 songs are free, right? Nice. And when you come out to a concert, yeah, you only gonna pay 30 bucks, but I'm finna perform for two hours, right? You know, and that's been the story of my fans. So I have fans who came, been to 40 shows, you know, on some like rock and roll shit. Like, yeah, I've been to every Metallica show ever. There's Lupe fans like, yeah, I've been to 30 shows. I've been to 45 shows. You know, I have every single album, every single mixtape, every single song, every single appearance, every single da 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 da. Um, and so that's what I attributed to. I attributed to that, you know, because the 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 barrier to entry to be a Lupe Fiasco fan is kind of high. Um, you know that the reward and the way that people attach themselves to the community is is probably a little, is much much stronger as opposed to if I was just like a pop artist. Or like a one hit wonder who may have a massive amount of kind of peripheral folks. Um, but you know, do they have a core of like rabid assassins who will go out and protest in front of a record label for them? Yeah. You know, so that's, that's kind of like the difference, I think. Amazing. So we're going to be wrapping it up. I just wanted to touch on one last thing. Uh, we are actually in the process of starting a new martial art. It's called Joy Jitsu. Oh, wait. <laughs> yes. Joy Jitsu. Joy extracting, Jitsu. Extracting the joy out of life. We're going to be creating a belt system for it. <laughs> and what it is is that we're going to we're going to use it as a way to leverage our Budo Youth Fund and hand out belts for people who volunteer in their community or donate to our Budo Youth Fund to help kids get started in martial arts. So you could get a white belt at a certain level or a a blue, purple, brown. So it's going to be a way to give back to the community and it's going to be our way to connect our community in order to give back. And that's kind of the last piece I wanted to touch on. I know you're always looking to give back to your community and to help out uh, could you just talk a little bit about your community initiatives and and just let people know what you're up to? Yeah, so my my we had mural. It started out as the Lupe Fiasco Foundation, um, and we we did a name change a la Facebook um, to uh, mural a few years ago, and uh, uh, magnifying urban realities and lives. I think is the the acronym. Um, but a lot of that is my, my sister. So my sister's the super community activist um, type folk, but also an artist. She's a poet. She's on my album. She's a dancer, very accomplished, has a dance troupe. Um, and so she has this, a part of my, going back to my dad, is this a full circle thing. So when you mentioned Joy Jitsu and the belts, as, as you know, I could see people like, man, that's, you just get, see, people just giving out belts. Just giving <laughs> that's, out belts. that's it, buy belts and, on the internet. But they be like giving out belts for nothing. And this is when they fuck up because you could give my, and this is, you know, anecdotal and and truth kind of like from my dad is he would award black belts or he not necessarily black belts. He would award rank, you know, based on credit card, I'm down credit cards on report cards. Right. So if your report card was trash. Oh yeah. You weren't getting promoted, you know? No matter how good you could kick and break and jump and, and holler and kia and it's like, but your grades, you know, you're supposed to be applying all of this discipline and all of this application to all the fields of your life. And if you're not doing that, then your martial arts isn't complete. Right. He would also, you know, promote folks who whose technique was shoddy. Right. Um, but they had something in them an active an act an activeness in them um or a spirit in them that was above and beyond any belt that you could ever give them right and really they 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 should be giving belts to people it's kind of like that that piece like these are these people are of such a quality of life 
such a quality of, of mind and approach that they should be awarded. You, you should be doing your examinations in front of them, right? As black belts, right? And you shouldn't be how good you can kick and punch and how good you can block and dodge and, and have guard and choke and blah, 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 blah. But it's like, how good can you talk to your mom? You know, how good can you open up the door, you know, for old, for old folks? How good can you, can you, can you volunteer to carry someone's groceries? How good can you actually, you know, volunteer to cook food at the homeless shelter? How good are you actually at, you know, jujitsuing the, these goddamn books, you know, how good are you, et cetera, 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 right? So it got to a point where these, you know, you would see people, you know, getting their purple belt or their, you know, whatever, whatever. We, I really only care about three belts, white, brown, and black, to be honest. But, you know, we had this array of belts and it's like, you know, you would see kids getting, you know, their yellow belt very fast, you know? And it was like, well, you know, he doesn't even know, you know, this cotter or that cotter, this cotter or that cotter. And I'm like, well, do you know this kind of and that kind of and that kind of? I'm like, I can study. Well, he can he can study too. He might learn it faster than you. So now what? Right? We're not here. We're not here totally for um, just technique and skill, you know. And I think it comes from you know my dad having that first school and then having a the second school where his first school was all rough and tough technique martial art mastery, but everybody went to the dark side. Everybody went to the streets. They took all that technique and technology and became the world's greatest villains and criminals and super villains and shit. And it was like, well, there has to be something beyond just this technique that needs to be impressed into people. And that needs to be observed and examined and rewarded as well. So your point about jujitsu and that's, I think is fucking brilliant. Um, so my sister handles a lot of the community service work and it's really as I get opportunities, you know, we I filter it that way and, um, you know, do certain things that make sense. Um, but yeah, man, as much as I can um, affect change and, and help, whether it's giving somebody a coat or doing something that's a little bit more high end, um, like trying to raise awareness on, you know, linguistics and rap, you know, which may seem like, well, that's not like giving out coats. It's like, yeah, it's not, you know, it's about showing rappers that what they do because there's a lot of there's millions of rappers right showing them that what they do goes above and beyond just entertainment you know and if you can interface and plug into you know the the science of what you're doing and learn how to apply it in a universal way then you have impact and community service above and beyond you know any just giving out a bunch of coats to people you know during winter time once a year you know, if I can get you to, to be observant of the power of the word on a daily basis, your community, all you got to do is talk and you'll be serving the community because you're talking to them in, in a specific way with a specific set of intentionalities. So community service is always part of the program. It's always been a part of our martial arts program. It's baked into everything that I do in one way or another, whether it be from the, the content of my songs or, or what have you. So, you know. It's even me, even me posting up on Instagram doing martial arts is still about, you know, showing people, you know, this shit looks corny. I know it looks corny, right? Because people have told me it's look corny, right? Because we've had to do this, you know, yeah. at, at this. <laughs> These people are walking around in Nikes and, and track suits and you're in a karate uniform doing kiosk speaking in Japanese in the middle of the hood. Like you're going <laughs> yeah. to stand out like a sore thumb. <laughs> But can you get past that? Yeah. If you can get past that, oh my God, right? All of your limitations, all of your social uh, inefficiencies, all of your insecurities, all that shit goes away just by putting on that gi, right? And stepping out into the world that doesn't wear a gi. Yeah. <sighs> and honestly, that's one of our biggest missions is to help people with that bridge, right? Because, you know, fusing that fashion that look that aesthetic that cool style that way to represent yourself and not feel like you're darking uh, out darking <laughs> out <laughs> in front of all your friends so that's uh that's that's really what we try to do as well too awesome Solid. man you, you lupe you have tied so many dots together for us and this has been such an incredible conversation and we're never 
surprised with how martial arts influences people's lives and just listening to the stories you tell of your upbringing and everything that you've gone through i can totally see how it has been so pivotal in who, the man that you've become so thank you for taking the time and sharing us i'm inspired and i'm sure everyone who's listening to this is inspired as well how can they uh, stay in touch follow you any other places you'd like them to go to stay in touch with lupe boom, boom, boom. oh man lupefiasco.com um we've we've over the years we've had shit all over the place but past few years we've got our stuff together especially because now we're an independent record company i'm an independent artist congratulations so lupe, thank you man uh lupefiasco.com you can get uh show information concerts merchandise all of the album album releases and stream information there and then you know of course the social media is at lupe fiasco um and i post up time to time me in my backyard you know doing some karate moves so you can check that out as well. And then more more things to come, more more things on the horizon. Next year should be really good. So make sure you stay tuned in. Amazing. Fantastic, we will. Lupe, thank you so much. And we will be in touch.